All right, so good afternoon and Shabbat Shalom to everyone. It's good to see y'all despite the rain. And today we're going to do part two of our message, Jacob's prophecy of Israel's future. This is part two. Now, in part one, we talked about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> and we showed something very important. If we understand this one thing, this one thing, we will understand the prophecy of Jacob's So first, Jacob's prophecy of Israel's future was fulfilled while the Israelites dwelt in the promised land. We began to prove this by showing that Jacob's prophecy of Israel's future was the same prophecy, and that's the principle. If we understand that, we will understand Jacob's prophecy to his children, that Jacob's prophecy of Israel's future was the same prophecy that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. So if we know what was given to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, we know that Jacob turned around and gave it to his children. Now, all of us should know what was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in case we don't, Yahweh's prophecy promised that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have posterity, named Israelites, in abundance, and that Israelites would inherit the land of Canaan and eventually become 12 tribes with prosperity and power. And Jacob encourages his 12 sons with that prophecy in mind. So again, there's no mystery. We went through this last week, scripture by scripture. Yahweh's prophecy promised that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have posterity in abundance. Now we could scroll back history and think about the fact that Abraham didn't know how this would unfold exactly. Isaac didn't know how it would fold exactly. Jacob didn't know how it would fold exactly. And so they could have been thinking, yeah, I'm going to have a lot of posterity, and they're going to spread all throughout the earth. Just go wherever they want to go, and that's it. They're just inhabitants of different lands. But God specified and said, no, you're going to have an abundance of posterity. This posterity is going to live in what's called the promised land. That's where they're going to live. I have set apart a place for your posterity, and they will live in this land. That's why it's called the promised land, because he promised it to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, and to, <coughs> excuse me, and to their descendants. And he also said, they're going to become 12 tribes, and they will have prosperity and power. So not only are you going to have posterity, but this posterity will have prosperity and power. And then Jacob is telling his 12 sons, this is what was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to me. So I am telling you the same exact thing so that as you encounter problems, when you, first of all, getting to the promised land, but then when you enter the promised land, I want you to be encouraged because this prophecy will be fulfilled, okay? And for all of us, one of the most important reasons to go through prophecy is to see that if God did it before, God will do it again for us. A million little miracles happen, and sometimes big miracles happen even in our lives. So I really, in a sense, don't need to say anything else. Now, don't applaud. Because <laughs> I will continue even if you do a poll. <laughs> so let's turn to Genesis chapter 49, because now we're going to see what Jacob said to his sons. And you're going to see that it's the same thing that Yahweh said to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Jacob is just repeating it. And it's also interesting, you can think about this. Yahweh spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob directly. But it was Jacob who spoke to his children. Yahweh didn't speak to them directly. There's a reason for that, but that's for another message. So think about that. And as we go through the message, try to remember where these tribes are. You see that Manasseh is up here with big land. Looks like the butterfly on both sides of the Jordan. Gad below there, Ephraim, the tribe. And then you'll see 
Simeon is here in the land of Judah. So not really having its own separate place. Reuben's over here on the other side of the Dead Sea. And uh, then you have Asher and Naphtali up there by the Sea of Galilee and also by the Mediterranean Sea and Zebulun and Issachar. So just try to kind of picture that in your mind. But in Genesis chapter 49, verses 1 through 2. Genesis, I know you know it's uh, chapter 49, but did the promise start in Genesis 12? The promise did start in Genesis 12, exactly. Yep, the promise started in Genesis 12. And we traced that all the way from Genesis 12 to Genesis probably 47, somewhere along the lines. And we're going to hit 49 and then go back to 48, God willing, next week. So in Genesis 49, verses 1 through 2, Jacob called to his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear you, sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Now, the word um, last is acharinth, something like that. And then days is yom. And you know, like Yom Kippur or Yom Teruah, the day of blowing of trumpets and the day of atonement. So that's that Yom word. But the other word last is Acharith or whatever. So of course, a lot of people who've been taught one theory says, okay, this is what's going to happen to Jacob's children in the last days. So starting in the 1800s, arbitrarily picked, as the last days, that's when this would begin to be fulfilled. Well, we're going to see what scripture says, because it does not point to the 1800s, okay? But Acharith means latter, last, or end, hence the future. And Yom means a day from sunrise to sunset, or from sunset to sunset, or a space of time defined by an associated term like a season. <clears throat> so the phrase last days can mean last, latter, or future days. The following Bible translations in that same verse say in the days to come. It doesn't leave you with the impression even that it's the last days, meaning whenever you decide the last days are. But in future days. So that's the Amplified Bible, Maryland's favorite Bible. The modern King James Version. The New International Version, Christian's favorite version, the World English Bible, my favorite version, and the World Messianic Bible. Is that your favorite version? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's Daniel's favorite version. Thank you for saying that. He's got to repent after he leaves here. <laughs> but understanding the context of the phrase is the key. So it can mean last days. It can mean latter days, later time or future days, whatever, or some future season. So first we'll see examples of the phrase last days or days to come, applying to the nation of Israel's time exile from the promised land. So first they went into the promised land and then they were exiled because of disobedience. So we're gonna look at this phrase here, last days, as it applies to them after they've been exiled, okay? And this is going to help us to see that it doesn't have to be in the 1800s. And then we'll see in Jacob's prophecy itself that the context of the phrase, which he said, the phrase last days, that applies to what happened to the nation of Israel while they were in the promised land. Thus, I can say with confidence that when he says, I'm going to tell you, 12 sons, what's going to happen to you. In the future, he's talking about the future while they are in the promised land, not some arbitrary, fictitious time in the 1800s, starting the 1800s, going up to now. Okay. All right. So first of all, examples of the phrase last days applying to the nation of Israel's time exile from the promised land. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And this is a prophecy. This is Deuteronomy chapter 4, and we want to read verses 26 through 31. And this is from the web version. 
Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 26 through 31. It says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, and this is Moses speaking, that you will, <coughs> that you will soon utterly perish from off the land which you go over the Jordan to possess it. You will not prolong your days on it, but will utterly be destroyed. Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations. Now, this is interesting. <laughs> it's not a prophecy saying that at some time, starting in the 1800s, there's going to be this great multiplication of Ephraim and Manasseh, and they're going to possess lands and be the lead, because this is what is promised after their disobedience, and it's the curse. It says you will be scattered and not that you're going to increase in number while you're out there, but you're going to decrease in number. That's a part of the curse. Often curses are reverses of blessings. All right. Often curses are reverses of blessings. So verse 27, Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where Yahweh will lead you away. There you shall serve gods the work of men's hands wood and stone which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell but from there you will seek Yahweh your Elohim and you shall find him when you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul when you are in oppression and all these things have come on you in the latter days so in the future days after you've been exiled from the land and you shall return to Yahweh your Elohim and listen to his voice. So this punishment is meant to lead them to repentance. You know, I've said in the past, the four R's, God sends rumblings. That's meant to lead to repentance. That repentance is meant to lead to revival. And that revival is meant to lead to rest, resting in Yeshua. So he's saying, I'm going to kick you off of the land because of your disobedience. When you're off the land, and scattered in different places, you're going to repent and come back to me. Now, we know that this happened because on the day of Pentecost, what was the miracle that happened on the day of Pentecost? One of the miracles besides the speaking in tongues. It was that people from all over, Jews and proselytes, from all over, all these places where they had been scattered, they were in Jerusalem for the Feast of first fruits. And the Holy Spirit fell on them. And 2,000, or was it 3,000? 3,000 were baptized in one day. That is a fulfillment. That doesn't sound like 1800s to me. That sounds like it was 30 AD to me. Okay? So that's one of the fulfillments of it. So when you are in oppression and all these things have come on you in the latter days, you or future times, you shall return to Yahweh your Elohim and listen to his voice. For Yahweh your Elohim is a merciful Elohim. He will not fail you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. And in this particular case, that part of the covenant which he swore to them was in your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And that's through Yeshua, okay? <clears throat> now, another prophecy. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 29. And here it says, for I, again, Moses is speaking, for I know that after my death, you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn away from the way which I've commanded you. And evil will happen to you in the latter days because you will do that which is evil in Yahweh's sight to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And if we look at this phrase, you will do that which is evil in Yahweh's sight to provoke him to anger. He's pointing to them doing evil at that time and at future times, because they constantly did evil. And he's, he's using that to say, these are some of the latter days in future times, right now, plus in future times, you're gonna do evil, okay? So evil happened to the 10 tribes of Israel 
by Assyria in 721 BC. That's a fulfillment of this prophecy. And if you read, and we're not going to turn to these, but if you read in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 6, and then 16 through 18, that talks about because, and it uses this phrase, because they did that which was evil in Yahweh's sight, he sent the Assyrians against them and finally removed the 10 tribes, the house of Israel, the northern tribes. He sent them into captivity in 721 BC. Evil also happened to the three tribes of Judah by Babylon in 587 BC. And you can read that in 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 18 through 20. <clears throat> and also in chapter 25, verses 8 through 11. Same thing. If you read those scriptures, it talks about that because they did evil in Yahweh's sight to provoke him to anger, that's why he sent the evil upon them. And this is what it's saying in Deuteronomy chapter 31, 29. Evil will happen to you in the latter days because you will do that which is evil. So this is describing a time that's the latter days that was in 721 BC, 587 BC. So all 13 tribes, yeah, evil happened to all the 13 tribes, what that's supposed to say, by Rome in 70 AD. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41, where he was talking about the generation that existed then had more condemnation than even Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because Yeshua was there preaching the word and they rejected him. And we know that by 70 AD, the Romans kicked them off of the land. And when I say all 13 tribes, because when the Assyrians attacked uh, the house of Israel, the 10 tribes, a number of people from the 10 tribes actually migrated south and lived amongst the house of Judah. But all of <laughs> <clears throat> all of them became known as Jews after that time. So, but there were all of the tribes, representatives were there. And I think last week we talked about um, Hannah, a prophetess, and she was from the tribe of Asher. So even one of the 12 tribes was talked about. She saw Yeshua when he was born. Okay, so. All right, so now examples of the phrase last days applying to the nation of Israel's time exile from the promised land still. Um, we're in Daniel chapter 10 now. We'll read verse 1 and verse 14. This is still a part of the fulfillment. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1, verse 14, starting in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 10. It says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, even a great warfare. He understood the thing and had understanding of the vision, now in verse 14, it says, now I, we presume this is Gabriel talking to him, have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is yet for many days. Well, when was this fulfilled? If you turn to Daniel chapter 11 and verses two through four, Gabriel, the messenger archangel, and that's why we presume it was Gabriel, plus it was Gabriel that was talked about in chapter 9. <clears throat> so we presume it's still him talking. And he says, I'm going to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, so future days. But when do those latter days occur? Well, he goes on to answer the question in Daniel chapter 11, verses 2 through 4, says three more kings will stand up in Persia. So at this particular time, when Daniel was writing, the Babylonians had already conquered the southern house of Judah. And as Jeremiah had prophesied, they'd be in captivity for 70 years. They come out of 70 years, and, the, and Cyrus is the one who let them out of captivity. So he was the king of Persia. So he's talking about right now is the beginning of those future days, that three more kings will stand up in Persia. So starting from right now, that's future. If I say to you, in 15 minutes, I'm going to quit the sermon, or stop the sermon, be finished. That's a future time, right? It doesn't have to be years and years. 
I could speak for years and years without stopping, but it's not meaning years and years. So it starts now. And the fourth will be far richer than them all. That's, we believe, Artaxerxes. When he has grown strong through his riches, he will stir up all against the realm of Greece. So we have Persia. Is a, when Persia was in existence, which was in Daniel's time. Then he talks about the latter days includes the time when Greece is in power. And it says a mighty king, Alexander the Great, will stand up, who will rule with great dominion and do according to his will. When he stands up, his kingdom will be broken and divided toward the four winds of the sky, but not to his spot posterity it was divided as you know into four generals and not according to his dominion with which he ruled for his kingdom will be plucked up even for others besides these and who came after that after, after the greeks it was the persians the romans. the romans exactly so he's talking about even up to the time of the romans all right so that has to do with latter days all right now we're going to see in jacob's prophecy that the context of the phrase last days applies to what happened to the nation of israel while they were in the promised land because all of these as i'm sure you'll agree as we're going through it they happen in the promised land okay and you can see this is from genesis 49 and there's symbols for each one of these which we'll go to see so first we're going to start with reuben <clears throat> And this is in Genesis 49, verses three through four. So we just finished talking about the latter days, which is future time. It's just a prophecy for the future time. And we know from scripture that future time was while they were in the promised land, after they had been exiled. So in Genesis chapter 49, verses three through four, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed and then the father. You went up to my couch. The fulfillment. In First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. First Chronicles chapter five, verses one through two. Reuben is the firstborn of Israel, but because he defied, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. And the genealogy is not to be listed according to the birthright, according to his birthright. And then Judah prevailed above his brothers and from him came the prince. Yeah. This absolutely was fulfilled. Reuben lost his birthright. It was given to the sons of Joseph. And the scepter promise was given to Judah. And it says, out of Judah, the prince shall come, which is the prince of peace, the Messiah. And he came in about 5 BC. And he lived until 30 AD. I guess it was 4 BC and lived to 30 AD. Now I'm just going to show you this little chart here because this chart shows you i showed this chart last week and it has the descendants of abraham through sarah then isaac rebecca coming down then there's jacob and jacob had his four two wives two concubines and if you follow the green line down that's the scepter promises that went through judah and Pharaohs and zerah and then you have the birthright promises that went through joseph and then ephraim and manasseh Okay, so that part was fulfilled. Reuben, the prophecy about Reuben was fulfilled while they were in the promised land. No doubt about that. All right, continuing on. It was Dathan and Abiram, descendants of Reuben, who rebelled against Moses and Aaron in the company of Korah when they rebelled against Yahweh. So descendants of Reuben were always unstable like water. And that's the problem. We're going to see a little Woe video. Y'all might remember this. <laughs> you have sinned a great sin in the sight of God. That one you are not worthy to receive these Ten Commandments. Aaron. We're gathered 
against you, Moses. You take too much upon yourself. We will not live by your commandments. We're free. There is no freedom without the law. Whose law, Moses? Yours? Did you carve those tablets to become a prince over us? Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. Bitter waters. God has set before you this day his laws of life and good and death and evil. Those who will not live by the law shall die by the law. Edward G. Robinson, <laughs> one of my favorite gangsters, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> he played uh, Dathan in that particular part. So again, the tribe of Reuben, as not aiming to excel, chose a lowly settlement on the eastern side, also known as the other side of the Jordan. And again, if we take a look at that, not that I can make it too much bigger, but you see that Reuben chose really about the worst. So he was the top, but because he was so unstable like water, he ended up with the worst. Right by the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Ammonites. No prophet representing the church and no king representing the state came from Reuben. Though he's the firstborn, he lost all of those privileges. Bera, leader of the Reubenites, who had the ignomy, ignominy of being named the one whom tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, carried into exile. You can read that in First Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 6. Ignomy, it means he, a bad reputation. It's a stain on his name forever. So the Reubenites, they just, instead of excelling, what's the opposite of excelling? Degression. Regression. Regression failed. Yeah, they regressed. Yes. Okay, so that was fulfilled. All right, so now Simeon and Levi. Let's see about them. Simeon and Levi. Here's the prophecy. Genesis chapter 49, verses 5 through 7. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their swords. Oh, my soul, don't come into their secret. My honor will not be united with their assembly. For in their anger, they slew a man. And in their self-will, they dug down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce. And their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So you remember... It was <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 34, verses 25 through 30. That's when some people raped their sister, Dinah. And then he said, listen, we'll make peace with you. And he told all the males to get circumcised while they were recovering, but unable to fight. They went and just slaughtered. So the problem was that they slaughtered innocent people. They should have exacted revenge on the person who raped her. That's at that time it was eye for an eye. But anyway, God said, because it's their self will that uh, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So because of Simeon's persistent, angry self will, even after that, as a tribe, they were very self willed, angry tribe of people. 
the prophecy of dividing and scattering turned out to be the Levi's turn from self-will anger to God-willed anger, the prophecy of dividing and scattering turned out to be a blessing. So we see in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 14, summary of this, is that Phineas, a Levite, killed Zimri, or Zimri, a Simeonite, who had caused Israel to join itself to Baal Peor through intermarriage with Moabites. And y'all might remember that story, that Phineas took a spear and threw it through this dude Zimri plus his Moabite wife. And that stayed the plague that God had sent on the nation of Israel. Levites had godly anger. They were upset that the Simeonites were turning people away from God. And so they exercised godly anger, but the Simeonites, they continued to just in their own will do their own thing. And there's no problem inherently with marriage. This was a Moabite and she was married to Boaz. It's just that if the Moabites try to turn you away and that's what Israel was allowing to happen for them to be turned away. So that's why <clears throat> that intermarriage was a bad thing. Okay, so then the fulfillment, the fulfillment in Joshua chapter 13, verse 33. This is Joshua chapter 13, verse 33. Moses gave no inheritance to the tribe of Levi. Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, is their inheritance. In Joshua 19, verse 9, says the portion of the tribe of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the tribe of Simeon had inheritance in the middle of Judah's inheritance. And so again, if we look at that, we can see the fulfillment. You don't see Levi anywhere. So they were scattered all throughout and God promised they would be scattered all throughout, but they were scattered throughout to be the Levites. And that was okay because they did exercise some righteousness. So the statement by Yahweh, El Yes, right. What fell to them as their inheritance was for them to spread the word, teach the other tribes about Yahweh Elohim. Exactly. But you see, Simeon, Judah had a big inheritance. Simeon did not. He had an inheritance within the land of Judah. That would be like, uh, let's say, if anybody knows South Africa, and within South Africa, there's a little place that's called Lithosso a little portion of the country that's carved out for them. And this is actually a nation, but it's surrounded by all of uh, South Africa as, as the country of South Africa. Or we might say that um, Simeon has like this house, but everything around this house belongs to us. You know, and they have this one little part. Plus that Simeon and Levi, you can see that in that sense, they've now been separated. So God fulfilled that. Okay, so no doubt that that's also been fulfilled. Then we come to Zebulun. And we have the prophecy, and I'm skipping. Um, I think Judah might have come after that, so I'm skipping that because I want to save that for next week. But uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 13. This is from the Tree of Life version. Genesis chapter 49, verse 13. Zebulun will dwell by the seashore, and be by a harbor for ships. His distant border reaches Sidon. And the fulfillment there. This is in Joshua chapter 19, verses 10 through 11. Joshua chapter 19, verses 10 through 11. And this wording is very precise and is there for a reason. The third lot, the third lot, everybody's land was divided up by lot. God makes it a point here to point out the third lot came up for the children of Zebulun according to their families. The border of their inheritance was unto Sarid. Uh, their border went up toward the sea and Marla reached to blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So we find that the border of Zebulun was toward the sea and this was done not at the discretion of Joshua or at the choice of this tribe, but by lot. So God promised it, 
that they would all have place in the promised land. But he didn't say where in the promised land each tribe would end up. So they cast lots and say, okay, this is your lot. You have this area. This is your lot. You have that area. So by lot, it came out and it fulfilled perfectly this prophecy that Zebulun will dwell by the seashore. <clears throat> this shows that Jacob said this under a spirit of prophecy, which had its fulfillment 300 years later after he said it. Remember that Jacob was in Israel. I mean, Jacob was in Egypt. He got there when he was 130 years old. Time. He's 147, so 17 years, so about 200 years were left in Egypt, then 40 years in the wilderness, and maybe 60 years until everybody was settled, so that's about 300 years. This is full proof of the providence of the Almighty, and Zebulun is, Zebulun is in the kind of pinkish area. Up there. And what you'll, what you'll see is you see the territory of Zebulun. They're by the sea, which is the Sea of Galilee. And they could have access going up the Jordan River out to, if you see that river going up and out to the left, right above Asher, it goes out to the Mediterranean Sea. So they were people that, and it says that their border reached on Sidon, and that means that their influence, where they did their, yeah, that's all the way at the top left-hand side, Sidon. The top left-hand thing that you see, that's Sidon. So again, perfectly fulfilled, perfectly fulfilled, while they were in the promised land. Okay, so then we go on to Issachar. Issachar. The prophecy is in Genesis chapter 49, verses 14 through 15. This is for Issachar, Genesis chapter 49, verses 14 through 15. Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. Therefore, he bowed his shoulder or bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. That's the two burdens. He said, I'll be an agricultural type person. I'm just going to bow my shoulder to bear like an ox does, like a donkey does. But he also became a servant to tribute, which meant that as other people, marauders came to invade, because, you know, people constantly invaded <clears throat> Israel. They didn't want to put up a fight. They just said, leave us alone and we'll pay you some money out of our produce. So they became a servant unto tribute. So the fulfillment. Now, for this, I did go to Matthew Henry's commentary. And there's another commentary we'll read after this. So the men of that tribe would be strong and industrious, fit for labor, inclined to labor, particularly the toil of hub husbandry like the ass or the donkey that patiently carries his burden and by using himself to it makes it the easier. This is something they wanted to do. Issachar submitted to two burdens, tillage, tilling the land, and tribute. It was a tribe that took pains and thriving thereby was called upon for rents and taxes. <clears throat> uh, also, while well, we were in Israel, so y'all will remember this, when we went to the place that had the Nilo meter, you remember the Nilometer said that whenever there was a flood and the Nile River, Egypt, yeah, in Egypt, what did I say? Israel. Yeah, <laughs> Egypt. Yeah, while we're in, in Egypt um, and we went to the Nilometer, there's a place and that measures the amount of water that's coming down the Nile River. If there was a lot of water, it suggested that because the water would spill over, that the land would be very fertile because it would be uh, water. And so taxes would be higher. If on the Nilometer it was low, it would assume that there wouldn't be as much water, so they wouldn't have as much taxes. Well, this is similar in the sense that Issachar, if they had a very productive and abundant year for harvesting crop, 
then they would be taxed more and people would, they'd have to pay more tribute. So, so this now is from the biblical cyclopedia.com and Issachar's territory was and still is among the richest land in Palestine. Westward was the famous plain which derived its name, the seed plot of God. Such is the significance of Jezreel from its fertility, the Jezreel Valley. On Ispa, and I'm going to skip some of that, but it says that it's the paradise for its fruitfulness. It is this aspect of the territory of Issachar, which appears to be alluded to in the blessings of Jacob. And uh, I'm going to go down to the bottom. It says, he saw that rest was good and the land pleasant, and he bowled his back to bear and became a slave to tribute the tribute imposed on him by the various marauding tribes who were attracted to his territory by the richness of the crops. Okay, so that was fulfilled then. Now we go to Dan. This is really one of my favorite, actually. So is a car that was fulfilled in what scripture? Uh, that was, yeah, in fact, that was what I, I could not find in the Bible, specifically more history about them. I suppose that if I traced their descendants, I would be able to find specifically where they um, were attacked, but to tell you the truth, I didn't take the time to do that. Um, but thank you for asking that. So then Dan, the prophecy is in Daniel. <laughs> the prophecy about Dan is in Genesis chapter 49, verses 16 through 18. Genesis 49, verses 16 through 18. It says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Verse 17. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall backward. Now, let me ask you this. Does that sound like it's a blessing or a curse? A curse. And this is something that we have to understand. It's just like with Reuben who lost his birthright. He still was able to go into the promised land. So it's still a blessing that Jacob was pronouncing on his children. Even though you screwed up, literally and figuratively, you shall go into the promised land. Same thing with Dan. You did some evil, wicked stuff, but at least you got a chance to go into a promised land. And at least the Levites had a chance to teach you more about Yahweh Elohim. So all of these is still a blessing because if you're in the land, it would be like here. Hopefully, everybody here feels it's a blessing to be here. But some of us might be doing some really crappy stuff before we get here. And God might, you know, be cursing us after we walk out the door. Something could happen. But at least it's a blessing to hear the word of God. All right. So anyway, so we're going to see how this was really more like a curse than anything. But it's so interesting. Why do you think? He's talking to Dan and he's talked to other tribes and like in the middle of the prophecy, almost he's like, I've waited for thy salvation, Yahweh. What is that about? And why is it connected with Dan? Well, there's a very good reason for that. So the fulfillment. Yeah, from the tribe of Dan came one of Israel's most prominent judges, and that's Samson. So when it says, Dan shall judge his people, that's true. Samson, how many judges do you know of? How many judges can you name? Samuel, Deborah, Samuel, Deborah. Who? Right, that's my point. <laughs> you see the silence? There's very few judges you know. Even most kids don't know about Deborah and Barak. Most kids don't know about Samuel. Every kid knows about Samson, right? Because he's so famous. Well, this is what God is talking about. So we know that uh, Samson came from Dan. In verse two, it says something. It says, there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and childless. 
So we know he's from the Danite. And then in verse 24, it says, the woman bore a son and named him Samson. The child grew and Yahweh blessed him. So he's one of the judges judging his people, the Israelites. But in what way did he judge them besides, you know, I'm appointed as a judge? In which way was he a judge? And how does that tie into him being a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that by So Samson is a fitting type of what Dan's tribe did in first leading Israel into idolatry before being led into salvation. So that's why it says, and we'll go a little bit deeper into it. I've waited for thou salvation because Dan was the leading tribe that led Israel into idolatry. That was the lead tribe that led Israel into idolatry. And so they are like a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path. So a serpent in the way, an adder in the path. You know, serpents are subtle. It's hard to see them, but they're in the path. And as the horse comes by, they bite it and the rider falls backwards. Did Dan bite Israel and cause them to fall backwards? Yes, he did, by leading them into idolatry, wholesale. All right, and that's exactly what Samson did. He led a number of Israelites, himself included, into idolatry and caused some damage to be done. But let's continue. So Samson joined himself to pagan women. That's in Judges chapter 14, verses 1 through 2. And in Judges 16, verse 1 and 4, Israel joined itself to pagan Elohim. So just like Samson joined himself to pagan women and committed adultery or idolatry against God, Israel joined itself to pagan Elohims, and that's idolatry. And that was led by the tribe of Dan. You can see that in Judges 18, verses 1 through 31. Jeroboam erected an idolatrous golden calf in Dan. And we know that from Jeroboam's time, it always says for the succeeding king, he did evil like Jeroboam in leading people astray. But he set up that golden calf in Dan. You remember when the nation split, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, when they split, and Jeroboam took 10 tribes, and he said, I'm going to keep the feast in the eighth month. And he set up this golden calf and Dan said, come up there and worship instead of going down to Jerusalem and worshiping in the seventh one. So that's first Kings chapter 12, 26 to 30. And later Dan became a center of idol worship in Israel. You can also see that in Amos chapter eight, verse 14. So fulfillment, indeed, Dan was like a serpent adder in the path, extremely hard to detect, but very lethal in its bite, even for a big old horse like Israel, which it bit many times. So Dan did judge Israel in that just like Dan was judged as an idolatrous person, Israel was judged as idolatrous, as Israel foolishly followed Dan's deceitful, subtle, serpent-like path. So Dan was out front, and that's another thing. When a snake goes through the um, sand, you can see the pathway that it leads. And so they led the path, and all of Israel followed in the sin of Dan. Okay, so that's how that was fulfilled. Also, the fulfillment. But thanks be to our God, who mercifully provides a path for deliverance from deceit and death. Samson's death was Israel's deliverance. <clears throat> God willing, next year, um, I'm planning a message. And the title of the message is God uses even stupid Christians. <laughs> That's the title of the message. God uses even stupid Christians because Samson made 10 stupid decisions. But at the end of his life, he made one good decision. And that was after he repented, I am going to you know, push these pillars, kill all these Philistines, 
but he also sacrificed himself. Likewise, Yeshua's death is Israel's deliverance. So that's why it's connected with the tribe of Dan. When he said, I'm waiting for your salvation because God wanted us to understand. Dan led Israel into idolatry. But even though that happens, God is merciful and God will always send a deliverer. He sent Samson to deliver Israel, and he sent Yeshua to deliver Israel, and that's spiritually. Okay, so that was fulfilled. Then we have Gad. So the prophecy for Gad, Genesis 19, Genesis chapter 49, verse 19. I'm going to read it from two different versions, the King James Version and the modern King James Version. It says, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. And then it also says, Gad, raiders shall attack him, and he shall attack their heel. What is this talking about? The fulfillment. Jacob foresees that the situation of that tribe on the other side of the Jordan would expose it to the incursions of its neighbors, the Moabites and Ammonites. And because they might not be confident in their strength, he foretells that the troops of their enemies should in many battles overcome them. That's in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse one, which that one says, Jeremiah 49, verse one, it says, Yahweh asks, has Israel no sons? Has he no heir? Why then does Malcolm possess Gad and his people dwell in its city. So this is an example of Malcolm actually dwelling in the cities of Gad because they did not trust in Elohim. So they lost that battle. Yet that they might not be discouraged by their defeats, he assures them that they should overcome at the last. So that's in the King James Version where it says, but he shall overcome at the last. So troops shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. <clears throat> and then it says, which was fulfilled when in David's time, the Moabites and the Ammonites who constantly plagued the Israelites were wholly subdued. So let me show you this again to show you where this is. So you see Gad, you have the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, they could all attack Gad because there was nothing um, on their Eastern border to protect them. And Reuben was worthless. So they could even go through Reuben and attack there. Okay. Uh, no, Benjamin, Benjamin fought a lot. They were good fighters. Hmm? Yes. <laughs> All right. So to see this, again, Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, that says, Balak said to Balaam, I see him, but not now. I see him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel and shall strike through the corners of Moab. So we know the Moabites were struck. And also King David dedicated to Yahweh all the plunder he gained from all the nations he subdued, including the Moabites and Ammonites. And then in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses one through two, it says, Nehemiah read to Israel from the book of Moses that Ammonites and Moabites should not enter into assembly of uh, Yahweh forever because they hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our Elohim turned the curse into a blessing. So we know that the Moabites and the Ammonites were wholly subdued. So that was the fulfillment that uh, Gad was a part of um, the fighting army that eventually subdued the Moabites. So that's what it says, Gad raiders shall attack him and he shall attack their heel. If you've ever stepped on something, uh, your foot barefoot like a knife or a real sharp blast, it really hurts and disables you. Okay, then we get to Asher. Asher is the next one. This is in Genesis chapter 49, verse 20. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat and he shall yield royal dainties. So the fulfillment. And this is from John Gill's exposition of the Bible. And I'm going to have to skip a lot of this, but it just says out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, which signifies this tribe would have a sufficiency of food out of their own land. 
So they have very prosperous land. And when it says he shall yield royal dainties, that's food fit for kings. And here King Solomon had one of his purveyors to provide food for him and his household. You can read that in 1 Kings <coughs> chapter 4, verse 16. And uh, also the tribe of, uh, not the tribe, but the city of Cana, which who has, um, so that would be Brother Fagbemi. <laughs> Do you have any more of the wine from Cana left? Hey, uh, Israel. Yeah, Israel. You, you still have some left? You got some small. We still have some left, and we're not sharing it with anybody <laughs> because it is delicious. It is the best wine we've tasted. This is like, I mean, we went in 2019, I think, right before the pandemic, and man, we savor it. Um, it is really delicious. So anyway, Cana was a part of the tr tribe of Asher, where we had the water turned into wine, and also. Um, I talked about that already. Hannah, the daughter of Penuel, was one of the first people to recognize Yeshua as the Messiah, and thereafter she prophesied about him, and that's in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38, where that one says, a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher, did not depart from the temple, seeing Yahweh, serving Yahweh with fastings and prayer night and day, coming in at that instant gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those eagerly expecting redemption. Okay, so that was also fulfilled. They had very prosperous land, oops. And if you look at that one, which I think it was here, the land of Asher is yep, north, very prosperous land. And I think Marilyn, you were asking, or no, that was Charlene. Charlene was saying that, she looks at uh, a travel program. When you fly over Israel, they use drones and planes. Fly over Israel, a lot of it is desert, but that's more toward the south. Toward the north is where it's very, very prosperous, uh, very green, even to this day. All right, then Naphtali, Naphtali. Let's see about Naphtali. This is Genesis 49, 21. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He gives goodly words. Uh, again, this, to me, it is so amazing when you really meditate on what our father has revealed and, you know, words are so significant. So he gives goodly words. All right. In Deuteronomy 33, 23, which is another prophecy about the um, 12 tribes, Moses prophesied, Naphtali, one who is satisfied with favor and full of Yahweh's blessings. So full of Yahweh's blessings. And they give goodly words. So how is this fulfilled? In Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Leaving Nazareth, Yeshua came and lived in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali toward the sea, Beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light. To those who sat in the region in shadow of death, to them light has dawned. So the fulfillment is that Yeshua did most of his work out of this area. So truly, they were full of Yahweh's blessings. Truly, out of their goodly words came. So again, if we look at that area... Naphtali and Zebulun up there at the top near the Sea of Galilee. And that's where Yeshua did most of his work. So while we were in Israel and we were on the Sea of Galilee and touring Capernaum and those kind of places, we were in the part of the land that was given to Naphtali as their inheritance and Zebulun. Okay. All right. So uh, that's that one. Then we go to Benjamin, and I think Benjamin is the last one for today. Then we go to Benjamin. Now, this is, besides Judah, my favorite one, because <laughs> it's amazing how <laughs> this was fulfilled. So Genesis chapter 49, verse 27. 
Genesis 49, 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he shall devour the prey. And at night, he shall divide the spoil. So he goes out hunting in the morning, devours the prey. And at night, he divides the spoil amongst his siblings or offspring. So the fulfillment. The fulfillment. In the morning, figuratively speaking, of Israel's chastisement, it was Ehud who devoured the prey, i.e. Eglon, king of Moab. So he's one of the judges. And he devoured the prey. Um, and he's from Benjamin. And in the evening, he divided the spoil. That's in Judges chapter 3, verses 12 through 30. And he's from the tribe of Benjamin. In the morning of King Saul's reign, he defeated his enemies. And in the evening, he divided the spoils amongst the Israelites. King Saul is also from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 47 through 48. When Saul had taken the kingdom over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side against Moab, Ammon, Edom, and the kings of Zoab, and the Philistines on every occasion. He defeated them. He did valiantly and struck the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hand of those who plundered them. So he took the plunder and he divided the spoils. Okay. Also, I don't know if y'all knew this, but this is interesting to me. Did y'all know that um, Mordecai and probably Esther too, that they were of the tribe of Benjamin? Yes. I so you knew. Okay, so you just looked at a movie. Yeah. Okay. And both of them. Huh? Both of them. Yeah, both because that was her uncle. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Yep. So Esther chapter 7, verse 10. Haman was hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, but we're going to skip around. King Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, to Esther the queen. The king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So again, they devoured the prey because Haman was hanged in the gallows, and then <clears throat> they're dividing the spoil. So the king granted the Jews who were in every city to gather themselves together to, and to defend their life, to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all the power of the people in the province that would assault them, their little ones and the women, and to plunder their possession. So all the people around, because there was a proclamation, kill all the Jews. Well, now it's like I'm reversing that. You Jews can kill all the people who try to kill you, take their possessions. So in the morning, they devour the prey. In the evening, they divide the spoils. So Mordecai went out of the presence of the king in royal clothing of blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shudah shouted and was glad that Jews had light, gladness, joy, and honor. In every province and in every city, wherever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had gladness, joy, a feast, and a good day. Many from among the peoples of the land became Jews for fear the Jews was fallen on them. Okay. Yeah, because Benjamin was part of the tribe. So how was Jacob's prophecy of Benjamin devouring the prey and dividing the spoil fulfilled in the example above? We just talked about that. And so now the last part is the end of the message. This is in Acts chapter this is not King Saul, but the apostle who became Paul. He's also from the tribe of Benjamin. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. In the morning, he's devouring the prey. In the morning of his life, meaning while he's immature, not yet converted to become a Christian. So Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. And that day there was a great persecution on the church at Jerusalem. All were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The devout men buried Stephen and made a great mourning over him. But Saul ravaged the church, entering into every house and dragging men and women off to prison. Then chapter nine, verses 11 through 22. This is in the evening as he matures. 
he's going to begin to divide the spoil, which is the word of God. He persecuted people for the word of God. Then he preached the word of God. So Acts chapter 9, verse 11 through 22. The Lord said to Ananias, arise, go out to the street, which is called straight and inquire in the house of Judah for one named Saul, a man of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in the vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in, laying his hands on him that he might receive his sight. But Ananias answered, I'm scared of this dude. And God said, <laughs> go your way, for he is my chosen vessel to bear my name before the nations and the children of Israel, nations and kings. Oh, look at that. Somehow that got off. Anyway, so then verse 17, Ananias departed and he laid hands on Saul, who was laying hands on other people to bring him to prison. So now Saul had hands laid on him. And I'm sure this guy was scared to do that. But he said, received the Holy Spirit. Immediately the scales from fell from his eyes. He awoke and was baptized. He went into the synagogues proclaiming the Christ that he is the son of God. And everybody was amazed. And Saul increased more and more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived at Damascus. So how was Jacob's prophecy of Benjamin devouring the prey and dividing the spoil fulfilled in the example above? Well, we already talked about that. So that's the sons of Jacob, the first 10. God willing, next week we'll cover Judah and then Joseph. And of course, Joseph was split into Ephraim and Manasseh. But as we saw in this example, all of their prophecies, all the prophecies about each one of them was fulfilled while they were in the promised land. It might not have been while they were total owners of the promised land, because, of course, the Babylonians took some captive to Babylon. Some remained back. The Persians allowed some to go back under Ezra and Nehemiah. And that was in the time also of Esther and Haman and Esther and Mordecai. And during the Greek period of time, of course, Jews were in Israel also. During the Roman time, Jews were in Israel, though they didn't own the land. But all of the time, while they were in the promised land, up until 70 AD, all of these prophecies were fulfilled before they were kicked off the promised land. So thus, again, this message is that all of the prophecies to all 12 tribes were fulfilled while they were in the promised land. Okay. So any questions or comments? Yes, Charlene. <laughs> She's ready. Go for it. <laughs> but, but, but hold on, Charlene first. Okay. And I'm going to, let me do one other thing, which is going to be to stop the recording. Okay.